Moses actually uses his last sermon to try to try to serve the best interests of the Israelite people to try one more time to get their attention and to give them the word of God. And what he says here in this passage, he says that, you know, you, you are dealing with serious business, people, today, this day. You're dealing with your relationship with God. And my friends, your relationship with God is serious business.
may be seated. Please join me now in the unison prayer of illumination found in your book. Shall we pray? Gracious Lord, we ask that your spirit of love be poured out upon us now. Open our hearts that we might understand your word this day. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, <clears throat> verses 15 through 20. This is Moses speaking to the Israelites just before they enter into the promised land. Listen now to this word from Holy Scripture. See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways, and by keeping His commandments, and His statutes, and His ordinances, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you this day that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land which you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you, you life and death, blessing and curses. Therefore, choose life, that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice, and cleaving to Him. For that means life to you, and length of days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we will hear one verse of Jesus Loves Me for the time of children. Fly. I don't know why she swallows a fly. 
perhaps she'll die. I know the way to swallow a cat. Think of that, to swallow a cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wiggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she called swallow the fly. Perhaps she'll die. I know in a woman who swallowed a dog. Oh, what a job to swallow a dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wiggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she followed the swallows fly. Perhaps she died. I know her woman who swallowed a goat. She popped open her throat and swallowed a goat. She swallowed the goat to catch the dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wiggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. I think she'll die. I know a woman who swallowed a cow. Don't ask me how she swallowed the cow. She swallowed the cow to catch the goat. She swallowed the goat to catch the dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed the bird. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wiggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she died. She'll die. I know of a woman who swallowed a horse. She's full of horse. Do you think this is like you made a lot of decisions in this book? That she, she accidentally swallowed a fly, and then she made a choice to eat a spider because the spider would eat the fly. But then that didn't happen, so she swallowed a bird to do that. So she kept making all of these decisions. And one decision or one choice was kind of crazier than the one before, but kind of fed off of that one, right? Yeah, you know, sometimes not just crazy old ladies do things like that, but we all can do things like that. We can also make one decision and then just keep making bad decisions because of that one decision. So Moses was telling the Israelite people as they were not ready to go into the promised land because they had been wandering around in the wilderness for about 40 years because they kind of felt making bad decisions. And they were finally getting ready to go into the promised land and Moses was warning them to always, when you're making a decision, make the decision that leads you toward God because you can never go wrong with that decision. And you know, that still holds true for us today. When we're looking at a choice that we have to make, if one of them is leading you toward God and the other one isn't, let's always try to pick the one that's leading us toward God. Okay? Let's say prayer. Dear God, as we make decisions, help us to follow you. Amen. Thank you, John. I don't know why I should call the fly. It is. I've read that many times. That's why. Very interesting uh, uh, book there. Uh, the last sermon. Uh, Rick, you don't have to worry. It's not, it's not my last sermon. You're okay. I'll be here next Sunday. All right. Uh, as far as that's concerned. Uh, I entitled my message to say the last sermon because I wanted to share with you some of the words of Moses when Moses actually gave his last sermon at least as far as we have recorded in the Old Testament. And if you've been reading through the Old Testament, as I've been hoping that you will 
uh, tried to do uh, the first part of this year. Um, you read all about Moses and, of course, the many exploits of the uh, Israelite people as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And if you think about it, uh, 40 years in the wilderness with Moses as their leader. Moses was the prophet of God. He was the one that was speaking to them, preaching to them, if you will, for that entire 40-year period and probably also for the period before that as they were trying to, uh, he was trying to arrange the people's exile uh, from out of Egypt uh, to this new promised land. Um, 40 years of listening to this person uh, expound upon the, the Word of God and what God was saying to the people of Israel. They were listening to his messages. And this message that Richard read a part of for us this morning was the very last message that Moses was going to be giving to uh, the Israelite people. Uh, so I certainly would think that it would have been a very important message as far as Moses was concerned because he knew that, it, that his time was at an end. God had told him that he was not going to be going into the promised land. Uh, with the people, that his days were now at an end. And he knew this was really his last opportunity to speak to these people that he'd been leading for 40 years. So I've always thought that this passage from Deuteronomy, where Moses is speaking to the Israelite people, had to be one of the most important things that he ever had to say to them. Because if it's the last time, if you know it's the very last time you're going to be speaking to someone, wouldn't you want to say something significant? Wouldn't you want to say something important that you really feel uh, needed to be said to this group of people? So this morning, I want to look at at least this part of Moses' last sermon to God's chosen people. Shall we pray? Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, thou art our rock, and thou art our redeemer. Amen. You know, I believe the Israelites, as you read through uh, Deuteronomy, I think they were a very fortunate group of people because, yeah, they had suffered a lot in their lives. And if you read it, they constantly are, are turning their backs on God. But they're very fortunate because they had Moses as their leader during this very important time in their history. Um, our scripture from Deuteronomy had the Israelites at the very end of the 40 years of wandering in the desert. Uh, they're there poised in the hills of Moab and they can see the wheat growing in the sunshine over there in the promised land. They can see the goats grazing in the shade. You know, it's right there. It's right within their grasp. And the reason that they are there is primarily because of their leader, Moses. Uh, Moses has served God and God's people well. But it hardly seems fair that he doesn't get to go with them into the promised land. Moses, for all his patience and all his wisdom in dealing with this cantankerous group of, of slackers, the Israelites, he doesn't get to go with them into the long-awaited promised land. And Moses has been told this by God, so he knows that his days are numbered, that he is shortly going to die. So in a way, this last sermon is Moses' goodbye to the people of Israel. <coughs> Have you ever had to say goodbye to anyone? Goodbyes are hard. They're, they're, they're difficult. And so Moses was trying to do his best to give some final words of wisdom to the Israelites. And I think to distill this passage that we heard read this morning down, Moses is trying to say to the people, hey, don't let life pass you by. 
Don't let life pass you by. You know, now, today, this is your chance for life. This is your chance to shine and to shine brightly. And I, I know this had to be a very emotional message for Moses. He knew his death was imminent. He knew the end was imminent. And he wondered if these people are really going to remember him. He wonders how they're going to remember him. He knows that he's going to be buried, not in the promised land, but here in the land where he's given this final sermon. And despite the fact that the Israelites often drove Moses crazy, throws him to, to raise his hands to God in sheer frustration and to say over and over again, what am I going to do with these people? Moses and the Israelites had a lot of, of memories together. I mean a lot of memories. Forty years worth of memories together. They started out as a broken, exiled people crying out to God to do something, to do anything, to give them some relief. They were demoralized, having been in slavery as a people for over 400 years. They, of course, were landless. They had no place of their own to call home. I'm sure they were beaten down and confused about how God was really working in their lives. And you know, Moses was confused too when he was minding his own business far away from the Israelite people in Egypt and God showed up in that burning bush. And God said to Moses, Hey Moses, take off your sandals, come over here, I need you to do something. And God said, Go help these people, the Israelites, for they are your people after all. And they are in the bad way. And if you remember the story, Moses is not exactly thrilled with the idea, but, but he went. And in the process, he used every leadership skill in the book to try to get those Israelites from point A, which was in slavery in Egypt, to point B, the promised land. Along the way, those peoples made some really bad choices. Some really difficult choices. They complained. They loved Moses one day and they hated Moses the next day. And they complained. They believed in God when it was convenient and they built golden calves when it was not convenient to believe. And they complained all the time. They said one faithful thing and then they did two or three unfaithful things. And they complained. And now, after all the misery, all the sweat, all the pain, all the labor of this trip that probably should have taken about 40 days, but it had taken 40 years, Moses finally gets the last word. He gets one last chance to talk to this group of people before he dies. Well, I might have expected Moses to sort of let these people have it, tell them what he really feels about them. Uh, this is the last time he's going to be talking to them after all, but the truth is, I guess like a parent who might have a fiercely independent and rebellious child, Moses loved these people. Stiff-necked as they might have been. So Moses actually uses his last sermon to try, to try to serve the best interests of the Israelite people, to try one more time to get their attention and to give them the Word of God. And what he says here in this passage, he says that, you know, you, you are dealing with serious business, people. Today, this day, you're dealing with your relationship with God. And my friend, your relationship with God is serious business. You know, God wants so very much to give you God's love and God's grace. And 
so Moses was calling on his people just as God continues to call on us today to try to make good choices in life. Moses seems to say in this passage, hey, don't continue to repeat the bad choices that you've made in your life. Yeah, you've made some bad choices. We all do. Don't continue to repeat those. And you know, that's always a temptation. My friends, it's always a temptation for we human beings. It's always a temptation for the drug addict to use again. It's always a temptation for the person trying to get organized to let things start piling up again. It's always a temptation for the person trying to grow in self-confidence to let someone else make the hard choices again. It will always be a temptation for the person who's trying honestly to, to grow in God's Spirit to fall back into self-righteousness again. If any of you have ever tried to kick a habit or just to change something about yourself, you know that it takes an awful lot of effort to do that. It's so hard to let go of the ways that have served us in the past. It may not have served us well, but it's the way we've done things, and it's so hard to let go of things. Even when we dig deep and we try really hard, and even when we know we need to change, and even, though, even when we know exactly what we need to do, it's hard. It's hard to make those good choices. So Moses tries to be crystal clear in this passage. And his logic is hard. It's not hard to follow. It's not hard to follow at all. He says, your relationship to God is the key to every other relationship you have. My friends, your relationship to God is the key to every other relationship you have. So if you take care of that relationship, if you make the choice to love God, to walk in God's ways, to follow God's commandments, then this last sermon that Moses preached is a feel-good sermon for you, for all of us. And God is going to bless us. That's what Moses said. But, and this is a really big but, my friends. But if you let your heart wander off on its own and you make the choices not to listen to God and you choose to pull away from God, then this last sermon is a hellfire and damnation sermon for you. Doom and gloom to you if you let your heart chase after other gods. Now that's what Moses said to them that's also what Moses is saying to us today. Doom and gloom for us if we let our hearts chase after other gods. And if you think that doesn't apply to you, remember that we all come from a very long line of faith ancestors who were tempted by other gods, who were tempted by those golden calves in their lives. Whenever God turned out to be hard to deal with, they switched over to a God that they could create for themselves, that golden calf. And if you sit there and think, well, I don't have any golden calves in my life, let me uh, suggest a couple of golden calf de uh, detectors for you to sort of wave over your life and check and see what uh, golden calves you may have. And maybe you don't have. I would suggest that first you look at your checkbook or your electronic financial statements, for instance. What did you invest your money in last month? What do your financial statements teach you about what you truly worship? 
Do you see any golfing calves in your life? Or look at your calendar or your day book, or it's probably on your iPhone now if you have that, with your calendar with all your dates on it. What takes up so much of your time? What do you spend the vast majority of your time doing? Time, which after all is more precious than money, my friends. Do you see any golden calves in your life when you look at your calendar, at your day book? And when it comes to, to resting in God or prayer or reading the Scripture, just waiting on the Lord in your life, how often do you actually do these things? And what gets in the way and keeps you from doing it? Whatever those may be, those are some of the golden calves that you have in your life. Maybe it's a job that, of course, promises security and well-being for you. Maybe it's a relationship that you have. Maybe it's a way of thinking that, that promises self-promotion in your life. Maybe it's a position in the community that promises power in your life. Maybe it's even a position in the church that makes you feel somehow better than other members. You know, all these little golden calves are happy to graze in our lives until they eat us alive. So you better watch it, says Moses. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, then you shall live. But if you turn your heart away from God, then down will come baby cradle and all. Now, my friends, most of us church people don't like those kind of pronouncements. I don't like those kind of pronouncements. It's not the picture of God that I want to give to our kids. Hey, you better shape up or God's going to get you. That's not the picture of God that I carry. And it's not the picture of God that I typically like to portray. I don't want to scare faith into people. I don't think that's a very effective way of communicating the faith. It's not an effective way to share the grace and the love of God. And in my lifetime, I've heard too many reckless pronouncements from all over the place, from televangelists, even from, from the pulpit in various churches that I've been parts of or that I've visited in, who use that kind of theology. And they say that everything from hurricanes and tornadoes to AIDS to the cancer represent God's judgment on people. And if this disaster happens to you, then it must mean that God is coming after you because of, of your sin in some way. Well, my friends, I certainly resist that kind of thinking. I, I don't believe in it at all. I hope you don't either. But sometimes when I read passages like Moses is sharing here in his last, summer, last sermon, I wonder if perhaps my resistance and perhaps most of our resistance to this kind of thinking is not simply that we don't want to turn God into some kind of big bad wolf, but instead it comes out of our wish to kind of live as though God is not really paying attention to the choices we make. God's not really watching the choices I make. Correct? Let me repeat that. I really believe we often live as though God is not paying attention to the choices that we make on a daily basis. But let me assure you, my friends, God is paying attention. God is aware of the choices that we make in our everyday lives. Now, I don't want Harper to think that her choices don't matter. Or that God doesn't care about her or her decisions. I want Harper or I want Maddie to know that God cares and cares deeply about them. And about what they do. And, and I want Jacob to know that he matters to God. I 
want him to know that, that his faith matters. I want him to know that whatever success comes his way and whatever failure comes his way, he always has a choice. A choice to choose life or death. And my friends, I want us to teach Jacob and Maddie and, and Harper and Elliot and each other to choose life. To choose life with God. Okay, Pastor Steve, I know I can hear you saying, hey, how do we do that? How do we choose life with God? How can we be the example to Harper and to Nicholas and to Elliot and to Maddie and to Wade and to, to, to Jacob and to, to each other? Well, Moses says right here in this last sermon that the best way we can do that is to choose life ourselves. Choose life ourselves. And that doesn't require some mystical magic wand to wave over our heads and tap and, 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 and to bring about some, some choice of life. Instead, choosing life is about finding your spiritual nerve. Choosing life is being willing to live each day with and in your faith. It's learning things you told yourself you'd never learn. It's enjoying simple things in life. Play with children. Laugh often and laugh loudly. But cry when it's time to cry. Surround yourself with what you love, whether it's family or friends or pets or music or nature or silence. Walk around the block every day. Take a walk. Turn off the television. Turn off the computer. Turn off the iPhone. Get together with your friends and enjoy the company. Invite someone you do not know well to lunch or to dinner. Clean out a drawer. Quit doing something that is not worth your time. Just quit. Do something so that someone else doesn't have to do it. Give money to those causes that you care about that are important to you. Stop arguing. Just stop arguing. Forgive someone, even if he or she doesn't deserve it. Forgive them. Walk away when the gossip starts. Have patience. Have patience with yourself. And have patience with all others. But stop having patience when it's time to tell the truth. Worship with all your heart. Love your church. Help your church be brave. Pray saying, oh, and thank you to God every time you pray. Pray asking God to change you in ways that you cannot and have not imagined. Remember all the stories of Jesus. See Jesus Christ and the people around you. Share God's love with someone who has forgotten it. See that all of life is holy. And open your heart to God's Spirit. Just open yourself up. Search for something deeper and better than your own comfort. Live a life that you and your children, and your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren can be proud. Find your nerve, your spiritual nerve, and just let go and let God in your life. 
Today I set before you life and death, blessings and curses, said Moses. Which will you choose? Life or death? Blessings or curses? Which will you choose today, this day, and every day for the rest of your life? The choice is yours. But along with Moses in his last sermon, I pray that you choose life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Shall we pray? Generous God, we are faced with so many choices in our lives each and every day. We ask that you give us the strength to choose and to follow you. To mold our lives after that of our Savior Jesus Christ. To walk as he walked. To care for others as he cared for others. And to love life in all its glory. Thank you, Almighty God. Amen. My friends, our hymn of response this day is Take Time to Be Holy, which is found on page 656 of your hymn. We're going to sing the first and the fourth verses of Take Time to Be Holy. So we're going to rise together, either body or spirit, and sing.
all hope that Jesus continues to shine in all of our lives. Let us pause for just a moment of silence as we prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. Shall we pray? Oh God, we pray for courage to be the people you've called us to be. People who seek justice and peace through your love for all of your people. You, oh God, are our hope for the world and it is in this hope that we live and move and have our being. God, this morning we lift up the people of Ukraine and the surrounding areas those under the immediate threat of war and violence. Give them strength and courage for the days ahead and help us as a country to find ways to not alienate people but to affirm all your people. For we know that each and every person is important and is a part of your creation. So help us to remember this in our dealings with others. Today, O oh God, we ask a special blessing for all those who are our role models in our lives and in the lives of our children, whether they be teachers, coaches, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, single moms who have to both mother and father the children, deacons and elders in the church, even pastors. Give them patience, understanding, and unconditional love for those to whom they are this role model. This morning we also lift up those in our congregation who are sick or hurting in any way. Give them peace and strength to face their situations. Give strength to the ailing and the sick. Comfort those who are hurting in any way, especially for those who have lost loved ones. And continue to help us as a church to find ways to feed the hungry in our community. God, we ask you to help us to be the change agents in this world. Give us courage to speak out about our faith. To teach those around us about your love for all people. And to lead by example especially by showing and speaking to all others with respect and love. All these things we ask in the name of the Prince of Peace, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for us. Amen. We will collect an offering this morning by having offering folks available table as you leave the sanctuary or near the door before you leave. If you've not had an opportunity to, to deposit your tithe or offering as you came in this morning, please take advantage and do so as you depart this place. And once again, we thank you for continuing to contribute financially and in all other ways to the many ministries of this church here in St. Genevieve. Now hear this offertory blessing for those gifts that have already been received and those yet to be received this day. Almighty God, we once again bring to you our tithes and our offerings. We ask that you bless them just as you bless our service to the church to help in the furthering of your kingdom on this earth. So use these gifts, these offerings, as well as all of our gifts of talent and service to your good use throughout this world. In your holy name, we ask these things. Amen. 
Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 655. It is Sanctuary, and we are going to rise together as one people, either in body or in spirit, and sing one last time. Number 655, shall we rise? Let's sing. Oh, man.